This episode is dedicated to the memory of Sidhu Musewala. He was a writer, a poet, a philosopher and a politician. But above all else, he was one of the greatest Punjabi singers to have been born out of India. At times, his music was seen as controversial. And I didn't know him personally. But looking back at some of his interviews, he comes across as one of the most humble souls to have walked the earth. Unfortunately, he was taken from us at a tender age of just 28 years old, going down in cold blood on the 29th of May, 2022. With over 5 billion views on YouTube and rumours of him doing future collaborations with the likes of Drake, Eminem and others, he truly was about to do great things. As a Punjabi growing up in the UK, I very rarely got to know about the rich heritage and history of the Punjab. So this episode is dedicated to one of the lions of Punjab. Rest in peace, Siddhu Musewala. 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 Hey folks, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. I'm your host, Paddy Danda, and today I have a guest that I've been trying to get on the podcast for about a year. We've been exchanging messages in the background, and we finally made it happen. I have to say, out of every single episode that I've ever recorded, this is the one that I've been looking forward to the most. It's probably the one that's closest to my heart because of the connection with my own culture, my own religion. And it's an episode that I'd love my kids to listen to because I think they're going to discover a lot about their history. But I think anybody out there who is passionate about leadership will find this episode fantastic. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Matthew Lockwood to the show. Hey, Matthew, how are you doing? Doing wonderful. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to uh, finally get together and be able to talk about history and its connection to the present, which I think is really important in this moment. Oh, no, I am really looking forward to this, Matthew, as you can see from the excitement in my voice. So you're a historian or a history professor in Alabama. So tell us more about you, first of all, Matthew, before we jump into some of the subject matter. Yes. So I am, as you mentioned, a history professor at the University of Alabama. My initial work, my PhD work, the work that went into my first book was far, far afield from what we're talking about today. I trained as a social historian of Britain. My second book project was a global history of the American Revolution. So what I was really interested in was what was going on across the world in this moment, this world historical event, which usually gets talked about in a strictly national way, a domestic way in America. And I wanted to know about what was happening elsewhere. And this led me to a lot of places. I researched and wrote about China and Russia and South America, but also to South Asia. And I talked about India and what was happening during the American Revolution in India. And a lot was going on. And this opened up a new world for me. I, as I said, was trained as a British historian in in a sort of very domestic sense. I focused on social history. And in the second project, I, I started really thinking about global connections and becoming increasingly in, interested in South Asian history. And this led me, of course, to Ranjit Singh. Wow. Ranjit Singh, or I guess the way my parents brought me up when we used to refer to him was Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Yes. And I have to say, as I was growing up, my parents would tell me a lot about this great figure, but it almost felt like a fantasy. It felt like he was someone 
that perhaps wasn't even real because of the legendary status that my parents used to give him. And I've never really read anything academic about him. I've never spent the time or the effort to do that, which I think is a real shame. And to see that someone like yourself has studied his life and brought his name into the mainstream is absolutely amazing. So just for the benefit of the listeners, there was a poll that was done a few years ago that you were instrumental in putting forward Maharaja Ranjit Singh for. And would you like to just tell us the story behind that? And what was the poll for? I mean, why should people care about Ranjit Singh? That's an excellent question. So this is a couple of years ago, um, BBC History magazine reached out. I had written a couple pieces for them before, and they were preparing a featured article on great leaders in world history. And I think there were 20 historians they were going to ask each to nominate a great leader in world history and write up a, a short article describing their life, but also why this person might be considered a great leader or perhaps the greatest leader in world history. When I agreed to write the article, I didn't know that it was then going to be put to a poll. The magazine was going to put out a public poll to allow readers and others to vote for who they thought the greatest leader in world history was amongst those 20 nominees, each chosen by a different historian. For me, When I was first approached about this article, the choice was obvious. I assumed that many of the familiar figures would appear. Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, Elizabeth I. And in their ways, they are definitely worthy for consideration as great world leaders. But I wanted to nominate someone that I thought was unfairly perhaps overlooked, certainly overlooked in Europe and America among mainstream publications. And so I decided on Ranjit Singh. And I did that because I thought he represented something that was increasingly important in the present age. It seems to me that we are living in a time of growing intolerance, growing division, antagonism. We see this in India with the rise of Hindu nationalism and communal violence growing seemingly by the day. And we see this in the West, in Europe and America, with the rise of white Christian nationalism and the violence that we've seen result from that just in in recent weeks. We see this around the world. We see it in Myanmar, Buddhist nationalism. And at the same time, we're seeing a redefinition of citizenship and belonging in many countries that is more strict, stringent, and limiting. And I think in such a time, we need to look to figures of the past who presented another path, a different path. And I think Ranjit Singh is, is such a figure. He was a modernizer. He was committed to his faith. And yet, he was also committed to toleration. His was an empire in which Sikhs and Muslims, Hindus and Christians, South Asians and Europeans were all brought together in the administration, in the army. And I just thought that that was a a necessary example for today when so many countries are seeking to exclude Ranjit wanted to bring in the the best and the brightest, the most capable, whatever their background or their religion or ethnicity He wanted to bring together and unify these peoples for the good of his empire. And that is a lesson that I think is in short supply and it's very necessary. So so for me, it was an obvious choice. Just going back to the article. So you put this particular leader forward and there were 19 other names that were also put forward. What happened to that article and how did it blow up? We were talking a little bit about this just before we started this podcast. And you mentioned those 500 words have probably changed your life more than any other piece that you've ever written. Yeah, absolutely. So after the, the article was written, it was published in the magazine, the poll was set up and people had their say. <laughs> and 
Maharaja Ranjit Singh came out on top of that poll. And I was surprised when that happened. I, again, assumed that one of the, the sort of more familiar figures in um, Western history would take the top place. I, I assumed you know, Winston Churchill, Elizabeth I, Abraham Lincoln, one of those sorts of figures would end up in first place. So I was surprised and delighted when that wasn't the case. And that seems to have been something that was felt, frankly, around the world. You can look at the the media coverage was incredible. Uh, newspapers and, and websites, not only in Britain and Europe, and America in South Asia, all over the world reported on this story. And I think there was a lot that was compelling. There was the obvious symmetry of Maharaja Ranjit Singh beating out Winston Churchill. So a South Asian leader beating out perhaps the most well-known representative of British imperialism, I, I think, struck some people as as both unlikely, but also as a, a sort of turning of the tables. And, and so that was often the sort of headlines you see are Sikh warrior beats Winston Churchill was the Times of London. And a, and a lot of um, the headlines picked up on that. But one of the things it also did is then gave space for uh, a description of this figure and his life and his place in history, which I think is really useful and instructive. For me, the most rewarding, the most gratifying aspect of all of this was the response from individuals. And as you mentioned, this is a 500 word piece, something like that. And I've had a, a much larger response to this than anything else I've ever written. And I've written a couple of books and, and this, this takes the cake. And I, I received a, a flood of emails. I still get emails and me being one of them. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> um, and it's been wonderful to see. It, it really, I think, struck a chord with a lot of people. And there are some consistent features to these emails. You know, reading through them, you see themes emerge. And, and I've been trying to think about this. Yeah. Why did this resonate so widely? You know, why did he win the poll? But then why did so many people respond so positively to this victory when they saw it in the news? And the things that you see throughout these emails, these messages, thanks. I get a lot of thanks. I'm not sure that I deserve thanks for it. I nominated Maharaja Ranjit Singh because he seemed to me to be worthy of the distinction. But I think the fact that people were thanking me says something about the need they felt to be recognized, to have their history more widely known, to have their stories more widely told. There's a sense in these messages of people who have felt like they've been overlooked. Their history has been overlooked for a long time. And finally seeing names that are familiar to them appear in the media, in newspapers and websites where they've never seen those sorts of names, that sort of recognition. And the other thing you get in these messages is a sort of infectious enthusiasm. People are just overjoyed to talk about their history, to talk about these stories. As you've said, that, that you grew up hearing, you learned about these things um, from an early age. And so it's been always been a part of your consciousness and your, your life, but that maybe you didn't see beyond that sphere that in the wider world, you didn't see those same stories being told. And so just a sense of real happiness, which again, in the present age is always welcome to see that optimism and that happiness. And one of the remarkable things is they came not just from Sikhs. I, I got messages from South Asians of all faiths and ethnicities. I got messages from Americans and Europeans. I just got an outpouring of enthusiasm and happiness about this figure and, and what he represented. And so I think that was just, you know, it was, as you said, transformative. It, it made me feel like what I had written, the work I, I do has a real impact. And sometimes as a scholar, <laughs> that can be in short supply. Yeah, no, honestly, Matthew, it really did touch me. Just in the way that you talked about there, sounds like lots of others had that same feeling as well. I mean, just to put things in context, that 500 word article that you put forward, I spotted this on the BBC website and 
it talked about, I think it was something like 5,000 scholars had voted in this poll. And the percentage by which Maharaja Ranjit Singh was voted the greatest leader was, like, you'll have to remind me, was it something like 40%? Yes, it was near 40%. Yes. So it was a, it was a clear victory. <laughs> As you mentioned, uh, one of the things you're interested in is, is leadership. And I think, again, in the present era, there is a thirst for leadership. We seem to sometimes be suffering through periods in which we feel a bit leaderless or like our leaders aren't necessarily to be trusted, or at least that we're skeptical. And I think... We crave leadership. We just crave the right sort of leadership. And so I think Maharaja Ranjit Singh was a popular figure because he seemed like the sort of leader this era is missing. Someone who can combine tolerance with personal faith, for instance, who is modernizing without leveling completely what has gone before. And I think we're all looking to solve those tensions at the moment. And so he resonates, I think, with today as, as much as he ever has. Definitely. I think if we ask people around the world, how proud are you of your leader of your country? I don't think very many hands would go up in today's age. It just feels like people are mistrusting all of politicians, even people in positions of privilege and it's such a shame. So Matthew, let's just paint the picture for the listeners. When did Maharaja Ranjit Singh come into the world? And what were times like back then? Because again, I've certainly been told about Sikh history and the hardship that people were going through at that time and how different religions were really at battle with one another. It'd be great to understand the situation and the scenario in which Maharaja Ranjit Singh was almost thrust upon into the world, into this position. Yeah, so he was born in a difficult time and perhaps a unlikely time for a, a sort of world leader to emerge. Or perhaps great world leaders require difficult times to reach that status. So he was born in 1780 in a time in which the Punjab was riven with divisions. It was fractured into a number of smaller states, often divided by religion, Muslim and Hindu states, just little petty kingdoms is perhaps the best way of putting it. There's no sense at the time he's born that anything like the Sikh empire that he eventually creates is coming or is even likely to come. And his, his personal life was difficult too. He famously lost an eye to smallpox. And so it was not an easy time to be the ruler of one of these smaller kingdoms. And eventually he began to unite the Punjab under his rule. In part, this was through some canny uh, alliances, including marriages, and in part through conquest. And so by the time he's 17, he's becoming a figure who is, at least in the region, increasingly well known. He builds up the Sikh army, and by 1802, he really begins to consolidate his control of the Punjab, taking Amritsar in 1802 at the age of 22. And so he comes to power as a very young man and in a difficult time. This is a time in which there are a number of empires, a number of powers in the region, all jostling for control, for expansion. And Maharaja Ranjit Singh's Sikh empire is one of them and not on the face of it, the most powerful. To the Northwest, he has Afghan forces expanding and raiding into Punjab. To the South and East, he has the remnants of the Mughal Empire and of course the expanding British Empire. And so it's a difficult time. It's a time in which good leadership is necessary, in which good governance is necessary. And one of the things that allows him to expand and consolidate this territory so effectively is 
his toleration, is his willingness to absorb the knowledge and the lessons and the skills of a variety of groups, ethnicities, religions. It's really interesting. His foreign minister is a Muslim. His finance minister is a Hindu. He has army officers who are Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, Poles, Russians, Spaniards, Britons, eventually. At first, he keeps the British at arm's length, which, you know, probably the right idea. Germans, Americans, there's a there's an American from, I believe it's from Pennsylvania, who ends up becoming a, an officer in the Sikh empire. And so he's willing to attract the best and the brightest, whoever they are from wherever they come. He's a modernizer. He knows there are lessons to be learned from other peoples, and he's happy to incorporate them. And he does this without sort of selling out his own authentic self, his own background, his own history, his own religion. But he is able to balance these in such a way that is it is remarkable and encouraging. I think we tend to think that tolerance, acceptance, those sorts of things are something that is required but can cause problems. That it's we have all these debates about immigration, for instance, and it's always about managing the problems of immigration instead of focusing on for instance, the benefits. And this is something that Ranjit, I think, realized was that attracting the best and the brightest had real benefits instead of drawbacks and problems. And so, again, it's one of the reasons why he's such a wonderful figure is that it's all of these great qualities that are the source of his success, the source of his power, rather than just a sort of add on or an addition. They are, I think, key. Oh, that's fascinating. See, I had no idea that he had actually brought in some of the Europeans, and you mentioned there about the Russians, into his closest set of people that uh, his leadership team around him. I definitely heard about him bringing in different religions, such as Hindus and Muslims, but that's really interesting to hear that he actually went beyond India and looked you know, to other countries and really had this diverse group of people. I had no idea. Yeah. So he's looking around him as he's, even as a young man and seeing the world changing. And instead of, you know, simply sort of holding on to what he knows, he incorporates what he knows and what's familiar with what others have to offer. And I, I think that's, it's such a wonderful story for that reason that, you know, his success is based on these these values that I think we all hold dear and we all, to some degree or another, feel like may be eroding in the present. And so it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful lesson. And just again, to put it into context, I mean, the Punjab at that time was flourishing. It's probably the biggest it's ever been in terms of the size of the region. And probably the biggest it's ever going to be. If we think about just how much land was the makeup of Punjab, it went all the way from India through what now we know as Pakistan, but through to Afghanistan. I mean, again, could you put that into context for us? Just how big yes, so, was it? Yes, it's it's massive. It's incorporating much of northwestern India, much of of Pakistan, as you say, and his capital was in Pakistan and what is today Pakistan and into Afghanistan. As I mentioned, this is an era in which Afghanistan, Afghan rulers are increasingly powerful and, and aggressive raiding down into the Punjab and, and not just a, a massive state, but one that is flourishing in many respects. And you know, the, I, the most famous is probably militarily. He reforms the army and makes the Sikh Empire a real world power on the back of that army. But it's also a it's a period of of cultural flourishing, of artistic flourishing. He is funding and financing and supporting religion and the arts, and not just. Um, his own religion. He does rebuild the Golden Temple, I think is famously, which had, was um, almost in ruins at the time because of all of these conflicts. But he's also sponsoring and helping to fund the construction of other religious sites, Hindu temples, for instance. And he visits these religious sites too. Again, it is remarkable. His empire is a multi-ethnic, multi-faith empire. And 
for rulers of states like that, there are some options. And one of them is to insist on everyone following the religion or the, the culture of, of the leader. But another is to to reach out and create bridges between those cultures. And, and he does that in a remarkable way, both through, as we mentioned, the, the sort of personnel of his administration and his army, but also in the way he uses the state funds, his own funds to help support other religious groups, other cultural productions. It's it's just it's a it's a flourishing time. And I think more fascinating and interesting because it seemed unlikely at the outset of his life. And because it in many ways died with him. When he dies in eighteen thirty nine, he leaves a number of successors. He has a number of children and several of whom want the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> And it's at this moment that outside forces, including the British, want a greater say in who comes to the throne of the Sikh empire. And that's really the beginning of the end of the empire. And so it is this really remarkable moment in which the Sikh empire is a major world power and a major cultural center. And again, it's it's all the more exciting because it's based on so many of these values that I think are important today. Something else that I read about was he was a very humble person in that I don't think he allowed anyone to create a statue of him whilst he was alive. Yes, I think that is true. Yeah, he is a, a, a humble figure and and one who seems more concerned with the benefit of, of his people and his, his state than um, with the benefits that accrue to him. When the British were, <laughs> I'm trying to use my words carefully, but when they invaded India eventually to start to take control, from what I read, the British felt that they couldn't defeat him at that time. And so they created a pact with him to promise not to intervene in his business. Yet they carried on their business as all. Yes, they, they even recruited his support against the Afghans who were causing troubles, not just for the Sikh empire, but also for the British in their Indian territories. And so they required this alliance with the Sikh empire that was in many ways mutually beneficial at the time. And the only problem with this is that when Maharaja Ranjit Singh isn't there to hold it together any longer, it provides inroads for the British, which will lead to uh, two wars between the Sikh empire and the British um, that will eventually lead to its collapse. In terms of his children, you mentioned the one child that, again, we as Sikhs always hear about is uh, Maharaja Dilip Singh. Tell us more about him. What happened to him? So he's a fascinating figure. He is the last Maharaja of the Sikh empire. And he's sometimes called the, in later life, was nicknamed the Black Prince of Perthshire because he ends up in the UK. His last years are spent in the United Kingdom. He comes to the throne at a very young age. He's only five in 1843 um, when he succeeds to the throne of the Sikh Empire. But he's deposed by the British at 15. And it's at this point that he moves to Britain as something of an exile in 1854. He's warmly greeted. He becomes something of a, a fetid popular figure. But at the same time, at least for me, there's something of a sadness about it. He is, after all, living in exile. He has been deposed from the throne of the empire of his father and um, ends up dying in Paris in 1893, which seems such a long time and a long distance away from the era and empire of his father. So a fascinating figure. And, and there are other fascinating ancestors as well, including one who becomes a, a suffragette in Britain, fighting for um, the rights of women, which is, is fascinating as well. Oh, tell me more about that. Yes. So that is, I believe, a granddaughter of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who spends most of her life in Europe. And I like to think has, has taken on some of the characteristics of Ranjit Singh himself in focusing on modernization and progress and tolerance and 
commits herself to the rights of women and is a champion of, of that cause in the later 19th century and the early parts of the 20th century. And again, another figure who is less well known, but probably deserves more, more acclaim. That's amazing. And I remember, again, hearing about Maharaja Dalip Singh when he was brought to England. It was almost intentional to remove him from his native land and to instill his mind with some of the Western thinking such that he would almost forget about his culture. He would almost forget about this dynasty that he was from. And at the end, they said he almost wasn't Indian anymore. Like he had been molded into this British young man who had lost all connection. And I think from a British perspective, the plan worked because he no longer wanted to rule the land of Punjab and continue that dynasty. Yes. So, yeah. So he's a, he is, as you say, a young man when he is deposed and he's, he's very much removed from the scene because the British don't want him to be another source of legitimacy in his homeland. And so he is brought to, to Britain and, um, as you say, educated and in a very British way, I believe converts to Christianity, although he converts back later in his life. But as a young man of 15, so many of his formative moments are yet to come. And yes, I do think it's a, a very intentional strategy on the part of the British to try to sort of win him over to to, to British, uh, a British way of seeing the world um, in which he is in many ways divorced from his homeland. And that's why it is a sad story in many respects that he is intentionally cut off from his homeland and his culture and lives a life of exile. Even if it's a, a life of privilege in many ways, it's a life of exile too, and a life cut off from the world he was born into, which is, I, I think, uh, tragic in its way. Yeah, and we got to get a small glimpse of that history last year when I took my kids to the Isle of Wight, where Queen Victoria had, I think it was a, like a retreat where she would go and spend the summers with her family. And that was one of the places they actually brought Maharaja Dilip Singh as well. And there's a few pictures there of him when he was there. And it just brought it home for me because I'd never really seen that before, some of those pictures. And just hearing about how he'd come from this foreign land and then be expected to settle in this, in this new land. Again, for my kids, it was fantastic. They're very young at the moment, but they were like, Dad, he's an Indian. And I was like, yes. Look, he's Indian and he's Punjabi. And so they really were curious to know more about him. Yeah. And it's a difficult time, I think, in particular to be um, in exile um, from South Asia in Britain. There aren't that many South Asians in Britain at the time. There are some notable exceptions, but it must have been a, a very lonely experience, especially for a 15 year old to arrive, to be forced off the throne and, and sent to a strange country and to be educated from then on in a very different way and brought before um, the queen, as you mentioned, just it must have been both a whirlwind, but also very dislocating. It must have been something that was very uh, difficult to come to terms with and difficult to, to sort of figure out one's place in the world and one's identity when you've been wrenched out of one culture and one history and placed in another, sort of on your own. That's, that's very difficult. And talking about things being wrenched, I look at some of the treasures that were brought over from India. The Kohinu diamond is seen as one of the most famous which was, I think, taken from Maharaja Ranjit Singh and lots of other treasures. I mean, do you have any views on any, any of those treasures? Because Maharaja Ranjit Singh had phenomenal wealth and some of the items that I've seen just on pictures just blow you away. I mean, even his throne and his chair was just something out of this world. Yeah, so... I 
as, as I mentioned, this is a, a time of artistic flourishing as well. And you can see that in, in some of the objects that remain from his reign. The diamond you mentioned, yes, it, it was in, in his possession and is now um, part of the, the, the British crown jewels. And, you know, I think there, you know, some symbolism there <laughs> um, to be sure. And his throne is, I believe, in the Victorian Albert Museum. And I'm not sure about the throne, but I know the diamond, there have been calls in, in the recent past to, to have some of these objects returned to to Pakistan or, or India or from whence they came. Perhaps we've seen increasingly these conversations about heritage and objects of heritage and where they properly belong um, and who has ownership. And it's impossible to, to look at these objects and, and not feel a sense of the history, both um, the, the flourishing of the period, but how that changed, how that collapsed, how that was torn apart in many ways, because you see these objects, these representations of such a, a golden age now across the face of the earth in various places, um, far from where they were created or fashioned. And I think there are um, stories to be told there too. You mentioned a little bit earlier about the golden temples and how Maharaja Ranjit Singh rebuilt it. And when we see in its glory today, it's seen as one of the wonders of the world, maybe not officially, but I think a lot of people that see it or have been there would certainly argue the case that it is truly one of the wonders of the world. I mean, just the, the architecture, the gold, the fine, intricate details that they added to the Golden Temple just to make it this object of splendor and beauty. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? As you say, if there is an official list, it might not be on the official list, but it's so recognizable. I think even if there are lots of people, even if they couldn't tell you where it was, would recognize it. Just seeing it, it stands out. It's, it's so obvious that it's the creation of a civilization and a period of flourishing in a golden age. And so it is one of the, the, the sort of wonderful artifacts of that time. I'm just going to throw in this point about when Maharaja Ranjit Singh was alive, one of his big focuses was on literacy and education. And somewhere again, I read about how during his reign, the people of Punjab were the most literate probably anywhere in the world at that time. And even by today's standards, I think it was one of the highest literacy rates it's this forward-looking nature of his reign and his empire that an educated populace is a productive populace and in many ways and not just in terms of economically but artistically and religiously as well and so i think a commitment to literacy often goes hand in hand with that sort of forward-looking personality and again i think he's such an interesting figure because he balances that forward-looking nature with his ties to his past and his his culture and his and his religion that it's not about abandoning the past um, it's about incorporating it with these elements of progress and, and literacy i think is one of those i, I think he's a, a figure who is often when he's thought about it's thought about as as a warrior and, and rightfully so i mean he does you know carve out this this massive empire but he's so much more than that and i think literacy is one of those things that really brings that to the fore I read somewhere about how he had this book created, which had an element of the fundamental skills like mathematics and different languages and some of the other essential skills. And there was almost this, this approach, which is so innovative. I, I look back now and I think, wow, it was a, such a masterstroke, but this book was circulated to the people and the deal was you work through this book. And once you've finished with it, you then have to pass it on to someone else. And it was a way of spreading education. Again, I think it's this emphasis on both progress and unity of purpose. And I think that sort of idea is represented nicely in this book. The idea that it not only contains useful practical knowledge, but that it, it's something to be passed on, that it's not something to be hoarded. That's also something that civilizations sometimes struggle with restricting knowledge who has access to knowledge knowledge is power after all and so there are always tendencies to want to restrict knowledge to limit who has knowledge and who has education and this is an example of 
I think that the better tendency to think that the more knowledge, the better, the more education, the better um, education and knowledge when it's broadly spread leads to flourishing societies. And I, I think, again, this is an example of that working in exactly that manner. Even if I look back to current times, we can see that women really have struggled to earn their right at the table. Think about voting in the UK. Is it the 60s or so was when women finally got to vote here in the UK? And I'm pretty sure in lots of other modern societies, they've had similar struggles. Even today in India, women struggled to get education. Yet, here was the leader of the land advocating education is important for all and really brought it to everybody in a way in which I don't think I've seen anyone do it in that way before. And again, how forward thinking was that? Because in today's world, we're still struggling with those issues, aren't we? Yeah, it's incredibly forward thinking. And I think in part that comes from his own experience in, in his youth, the influence of his mother and his mother-in-law were, were vital, especially in his early years when he was living in this fractious age, when there are all sorts of difficulties and struggles. Um, he relies on the women in his family and in his life as real allies. And I, I think that you can see that in his later policies and his later interests, that this respect for the abilities and the importance of women. And so I think it's incredibly forward thinking. It is not something that is the norm in that era. Or as you say, in our own, we still struggle with those questions. Honestly, Matthew, I could go and talk to you all day. It's such a fascinating topic. And as I mentioned at the start of the episode, one very close to my heart. And I really just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, actually, for bringing this to the forefront and being able to have a talk about it now. Me and you having this discussion was all because of the work that you did to bring this to the masses. And I know at the time, you probably didn't know that this is all going to happen, but it was amazing of you to take this particular person in history and, and to write about them. It's because you're passionate about this topic, struck a chord with yourself, and uh, I'm sure it's going to strike a chord with others as well. How can people find out more if anyone wants to know more about Maharaja Ranjit Singh? Are there any particular resources that you would recommend? Oh, there are, there are wonderful biographies of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and I, I think looking to those would be a, a first step for someone who wants to get more in depth. They can look to the articles I've written for the BBC History magazines, the companion piece for the the poll, the greatest leaders in world history. But I, the, the response was so great to the initial 500 word piece that they asked me to write a, one that was a little bit longer. For someone who just wants to dive in a little bit, they can look for that article. And then there are wonderful resources. I, I think there was a biography published just a, a year or two ago, I think, seizing on the interest in uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh in this moment. And so there are plenty of resources out there and, and I absolutely encourage people to read more. I think they will be fascinated and come away with not only a greater understanding of the past, but hopefully a, a different outlook on the present too. Wow, fantastic. I personally will be going off and reading your article, uh, the more in-depth one as well. Um, that's one I did miss. So I'm going to go check that out. <laughs> but it be great for you to leave us with a few final words just in terms of what are you up to in the future? What are some of the things you're doing? I was wishing deep down there you were going to tell me that you're currently writing this new book about Maharaja Rajin saying maybe that's something in the future, but what are you up to? So I'm currently writing a book on the place of refugees and exiles in British history from ancient times to the present, from Constantine to climate change. And so I'm really looking at the ways in which refugees and exiles have contributed to British history, how they got there, what they thought of, of Britain, what their experience was, and, and how the British regarded exiles and refugees and how that changed over time. And so I'm looking at individuals and groups from around the world and, and trying to trace, again, some of those global connections and bring individuals and peoples who are less well-known or overlooked in Britain and America to the forefront again in, in a similar way. So, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. It should be published in the fall of 2023. So 
definitely look out for that. Oh, fantastic. We'll have to do another episode when you're ready with that, because uh, that's another Absolutely. fascinating topic and very obviously topical at the moment because of the conflicts that we're seeing around the world, especially the Ukraine-Russia conflict. I'm sure in years to come, some of those people that have been displaced, they're going to be in a similar situation where they've embedded themselves into other regions and really had an impact on the culture uh, around them. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. It is very much a, a story of the moment. Well, Matthew, thank you so much. And as I said, I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I've certainly learned a lot just during this episode. And I'm sure others that are listening will be blown away by some of those insights that you provided. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. 